everyone. Good morning. Um, I bid you all greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Marcus Freeman, and uh, I have the uh, wonderful privilege of serving as your district superintendent. And thank you so much, ma'am. I really do appreciate it. Oh, what a blessing. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I have the privilege of uh, serving as uh, the district superintendent of the Crossroads District. Uh, in which we are located, and uh, we are a part of, uh, at this point, we are uh, 68 churches, and we go everywhere from, uh, so if I go, if I go, if I go south, Bloomington, you know, down that way, Yorktown, Rungi, those are the border down that way, Victoria, then you come on back along Victoria up there, Ganea, Louise, El Campo, all the way back up to uh, 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 Columbus, uh, Garwood, uh, Eagle Lake, go all the way back up to uh, uh, LaGrange and all the way back up to um, Elgin. Elgin and Manor. Yes, yes, sir, Elgin, Manor. Then you come back around the circle. Uh, you come around to, uh, I think we'll be in Lytton Springs, Lockhart, uh, Seguin, Sloop after Seguin. Um, I think, I'm trying to think, du Duville. And uh, we kind of start coming back this way, you know, Yoakum, all, all, all in between. Those are the, that's the circle of the area of churches that we represent. And uh, again, it is an, uh, an honor to uh, be with you and to uh, serve in this role of this day. I want to begin with a word of prayer uh, to on our time this morning. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of we'll move on to, to from there and kind of explain uh, our purpose for being here. Uh, let us pray. Gracious God, we, uh, we assemble this day um, in great humility, and yet, Lord, with great confidence in our faith in you, uh, assurance of your love for us, and um, assurance of knowing that you are always ever present with us. We especially expect and acknowledge your presence when we are gathered on this holy ground. Uh, this uh, sacred place where you, Lord, have met so many uh, along all the pathways of life and have led so many and have helped so many to have experienced the fullness of life and hope and assurance for all eternity. So while we gather together this day for our purpose, uh, discerning what the future is, as the songwriter said, many things about tomorrow we may not seem to understand, but we know who holds tomorrow, and we know who holds our hand. In many ways, we will go, Lord, about discerning our issues and decisions and, and thoughts and practical issues that are before us today. But may our discernment more also, maybe even more so, be about our relationship with you and what is important about our maintaining and keeping our walk with you in a way that is sacred and holy in our lives. So Lord, this is our prayer. We, uh, we thank you for this day. We're assured of your presence, and we're ever so careful to give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. Amen. All right. Well, um, um, I uh, am here today for... Uh, because I was notified by your leaders of your church uh, that you are, would like to begin a process in order to discern um, whether or not you will remain affiliated with uh, the United Methodist Church. And that is uh, my purpose for being here. The process called for the district superintendent to be present um, to lead at least uh, three, well, well, the three three listening sessions at least for sure, and uh, sessions uh, listening for the purpose of discernment. I have a little. Uh, um, sure, thank you for all the help I got to set set up today. I have a little agenda here. Uh, I hope you can. Can you see that? kind of okay, especially in the back. You can see okay. All right. Uh, we're gonna, we just open in prayer, overview of this process. Uh, we have a message that we're going to try to play from, from our bishop, that is introduc an introduction of this. 
and then we uh, we kind of go from there. But but but, but this journey, uh, you probably have already started discerning, uh, and that's discerning is, is what this journey is about. Discerning uh, is a word I've been trying to learn in the last uh, in the last few uh, months, especially. Not not a, a word I you know I, I always use have used as much as I have used it in the last few months. Now I've been just thinking about discerning and what it, what it what it what it means. And I know the the the, the dictionary is kind of there are different de- definitions, but from it all, I know that discerning is has to do with reflecting, uh, uh, weighing all of the options uh, to make a decision. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's usually headed toward making a decision. And when you're heading toward making a decision, and you're discerning, it's usually about, um, it includes several things. One of the things you're doing when we're discerning, you know, is we are weighing Weighing the options that are before us. I mean, all, all, all of the options, really. If you're really discerning, well, you know, honestly, weigh all the options, you know, all of them that are before us. And then we, uh, we do that. Then, we, then discerning is, is, a, is, a, is a religious word. It's a religious process where we are seeking, we're seeking the wisdom of God. We're seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit to give us insight and direction as to what is God's will, God's will for us. And so you do that, that we, we wait, however you hear God, however God talks to you, or you speak to God, or you hear from God, that is what we hope to do when we're discerning. But another thing about it is in discerning is weighing, you know, I always talk about weighing options, but, but there's a very practical consideration. Um, so, so to really discern, you know, in, 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 in Scripture it talks about no one builds a house unless they count the cost first. So it's, it's dealing, you're dealing with counting the cost. You're dealing with the practical consideration, dealing with the, the consequences of the decision. You know, what, what will be the consequences? Short term, long term, um, just practical considerations, and and all of that is wrapped up into that one word about when you're trying to discern. I'm just, I'm just, this is just two, couple of thoughts about it, you know. And uh, as I'm learning, as I try to understand what what we what we're being asked to do. So I'm going to begin. I'm going to try my best to see if I can make all of this work now with a message from our bishop about this discernment process. If you bear with me here, I'm going to try to, I think, did I turn it off or turn it on? This is a message from uh, our bishop. Uh, now, let me say about this. Some of this, some of you have probably already seen, heard. Some of it, you tw- maybe three or four times, probably already put it in a place. To, but this is a setting where I invite you to look at it with a, a, a new set of eyes among your, your brothers and sisters in Christ and for, be, to be able to talk about it openly a little bit, okay? So let, I'm going to see if I can get this to work. If I can't, then we'll just move on and uh, we'll see what happens here. All right. All right, well, okay, just a second here. Let me, because I think I'm doing something wrong. Oh, you know what I'm doing wrong? I need to plug the speakers in. Okay, that might help, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm not trying to silence the bishop. I'm just, I couldn't get, I didn't remember to plug the speakers in. Sorry about that, y'all. That means I'm going to have to do some things here to exit and, get, and, and, turn, and turn that on. Please excuse me. Um, I'll have to do a couple of things here. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Okay, we'll get there. Okay, I think it may be working. All right, there it is. I have to do this. Okay, then I can turn that back on, and we'll get back to that. Okay, all right. Sorry about that little uh, hold up. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Robert Stanley, Bishop of the Church of Jesus Christ. My 
I'm aware that there's a lot of conversation going around among uh, many of our congregations about uh, disaffiliation. Okay. When I think about that word, disaffiliation, that's a word that simply was not in my vocabulary until these last couple of years. And it, and it still kind of grieves my heart to think that it is playing such a central role in our conversations in the church and, uh, and distracting us from a fundamental mission. But, uh, uh, but, I, but I also just need to share that this, this whole, that where we've come to just breaks my heart. I, um, I'm United Methodist to the core. I'll remain United Methodist. And, uh, and one of the things I always appreciate about the United Methodist Church is not only that theology of grace, the unlimited grace of God, but also the fact that we have differences of opinion. We have different perspectives, and yet we're able to work alongside each other for the mission of Christ and, uh, and, for, uh, and, and for all the work that's a place before us. I, uh, you know, and, and, and some of the conversations between folks who are thinking about disaffiliating and those who uh, want to remain united Methodist are taking place in congregations where these folks have sat beside each other in the pew for years. They've sung in the same choirs. They've worked side to side in mission projects. And it, uh, it just grieves me that, uh, that, that there's so much conversation about, uh, about division. Uh, on the other hand, if we're going to enter into these conversations, uh, I just invite all of us to do so with kindness, uh, with patience, with uh, generosity and honesty. Uh, I think of Reuben Job's kind of summarizing Wesley's general rules. Do no harm. Do good. Stay in love with God. And I also would remind you that uh, any time you gather with, a, with, with, a, with some folks in your congregation or from various congregations, and uh, we talk about LGBT inclusion, that there are always some people present for whom this is not an abstract theo theoretical conversation. They're thinking of their daughter or their son or their brother or their sister or their niece or their nephew or their co-worker. And so uh, speak tenderly uh, when we enter into these uh, difficult conversations. And, uh, and, and, and so just a, just a few things um, that I want to address. There's a whole lot of information on the Internet, uh, mostly generated from other annual conferences. And, um, and I just got to remind us, we're not the Texas conference, we're not the Florida conference, we're not Alabama, we're not uh, Central Texas, we're the Rio Texas conference. And so how we approach conversations and the policies that we, uh, that we set that, uh, that have a good deal of mutual respect on, uh, and that's, uh, that's what needs to guide us. And just remember who we are. Remember who we are. Something else I want to uh, kind of set straight. There's a there are a number of people saying, uh, kind of talking about how there's a real sense of urgency about making this decision, going through discernment, and uh, and if the church is so inclined, uh, voting to to leave the United Methodist Church. Um, friends, th there will always be a way by which a church can leave the United Methodist Church, and uh, and I know that. Uh, the paragraph 2553 has an expiration date uh, of uh, December 31st, 2023. But uh, but there were ways by which churches could could leave before there ever was a paragraph 2553. It just takes putting together pieces from other disciplinary uh, paragraphs, and uh, while also remaining faithful to the policy that our trustees have set out in in how they're going to address 2553. But there is no urgency here. And so some pastors have even uh, kind of suggested to their congregations that want to have an active conversation now, why don't we wait till General Conference 2024 and see what General Conference does? Because the effect of the postponement of General Conference has actually been to take a decision that, that, that the General Conference was set to make for the whole church and pushed it down to virtually every local church. And that's why we're having as much of this uh, kind of uh, hard conversations now that, uh, that we wanted to address in another way at an earlier date. But another thing that's very important for me to communicate is that there is a place for you in the United Methodist Church. Whether you approach things from a more uh, conservative theology or a centrist or, or more of a progressive theology, you're an important part of the future of the United Methodist Church. And so you not only don't have to, uh, to, to form a, a discernment committee, uh, some churches, uh, I, I'm thinking of one church in particular, where one of, the, one of the leaders of the church, after some conversation about whether they would form a, a discernment committee, 
um, what happens to those that have passed through a congregation and takes the vote. So this video is part of a set of videos that includes some conversations with Kendall Waller, who is our Director of Administrative Ministries at Rio Texas Conference, and Kevin Reed, who is the Chair of our Board of Trustees for the conference. And so I hope you'll listen to those. Each one of these delves a little deeper into the details related to this whole conversation about disaffiliation. And also there's information on the RioTexas.org website. Uh, go there and look for We Are UNC Rio Texas, uh, and also on our Facebook uh, page. So there are ways of, of just getting a little more information so that we can all make the most, uh, most discerning decisions that serve the purposes of Christ. But more than videos and more than FAQs, frequently asked question pages, we want to be in relationship with you. And if, if your congregation takes up this conversation, we're here to help and we, uh, we want to help you walk through this. I, um, I love the people of the Rio Texas Conference, Lazy and Quigley. You, you are the ones who clung to me from, uh, from the time I was just a little kid in the, in the, in the faith of Jesus Christ. So thank you. Thank God bless you. Okay. All right. Um, so to follow up a little bit on what uh, the bishop uh, has, was sharing, I uh, want to show you that here is a, this is a, a realtexas.org. I'm sure if you've already begun to look at some of this, you, you know, you may have gone to realtexas.org and, and you can click on either of these boxes to find information. This is for this affiliation. All the, what you just saw is, will be found here. And uh, that is another one for those who are considering staying and trying to find their voice in that. There are more resources for that. But anyway, these are some, if you click on one of these two buttons and you'll get to pretty much all the resources that the conference is making available uh, for you um, for study and reflection. So uh, to further elaborate a little bit, if you please excuse me if I read a little bit here, uh, but the United Methodist Church has, it, it is a denomination that has always, from its beginning, we were united and merged uh, with the Un Evangelical United Brethren uh, denomination and the Methodist Episcopal Church back in 1968. And this is when it formed the United Methodist Church. And it has always been a church, a denomination that cared deeply about its mission. Okay? Its unity has been important, working with people, uh, for many walks of life. And while there are many differing gifts and thinking within the church, together we are committed to working toward unity and strengthening the mission of the church. The Real Texas Conference and its parenting conferences, you know, those, that, as I shared, that were, that were part of what made up the United Methodist Church from, from the past, uh, all have a long history of working with diverse people, diverse cultures, and understandings to preserve and grow the mission of, of the church in Texas, South Texas here. It has been our sincerest hope to continue to grow that mission and continue in service in that way. Um, at the time of that merger, um, it was clear that it was needed to be determined how the church was going to have a theology or think about God. We, we, we came together now, the leaders of that time said, we need a way, that a one way of thinking about God, right? Uh, uh, we knew that uh, we, we, were, we were all based on scripture, but there were different interpretations of scripture. So they decided, they thought about how to approach this, um, and they came up with what's called the United Methodist Unilateral 
Uh, the cordial lateral has got several names. But they came up with a way that would, again, allow for a, a broad range of interpretation. As you know, many of us in Bible study, if you've been in a Bible study, you sit there. We all read the same verse, right? We all read the same verse. But then, if you've ever noticed in Bible study, when you're sitting in a class, in each, sometimes each individual will see something different that that verse is saying to them. So, th in that time, they were faced with trying to figure that out with denomination that was just so broad from many backgrounds, people from many backgrounds. So, they decided to come up with this, this way of approaching scripture, scripture and, and theology to where scripture is primary, always scripture was primary, and then in order to interpret scripture, you look at it through the lens of tradition, you know, the tradition means like from uh, the, the Apostles' Creed, those who formed the Apostles' Creed, the apostles, the disciples, the church leading all the way up to now, um, experience, and that is an experience of a community, experience like, like, like your community, like each community has an experience and what their, what their community is all about. And then reason, reason is is, is scripture always talks about wisdom and the wisdom of God and seeking the wisdom of God. So we, we read scripture and we're interpreting wherever the verse is and what it's saying to us. We are being, we were, they decided that maybe what we should ask them, uh, allow our churches to do is to read scripture from the perspective of through the lens. Scripture is primary, but we should read it through the lens of experience, reason, uh, and tradition. All right? Over 50 years, the whole time of the denomination, um, um, you know, we've tried to live this way. However, throughout our time together, we have done so and have done some really wonderful things. If you look at, you know, the history of our church, and you have been a part of that through your apportionments and through the way you have supported so faithfully, so faithfully over all of these years. We have formed, I mean, I'm thinking just since the United Methodist Church formed, uh, there were already colleges and universities, but we've added many since then. Uh, we have missionaries reaching countries and nations all around the world, 100 countries around the world. Um, we have, uh, in our denomination, uh, uh, disaster relief uh, programs that are the first to respond. When, uh, when something hits, when Hurricane Harvey hit, they came from all over the world to focus on our area. And uh, if you know anything about what happened down in Bloomington, uh, wow, it's a whole new little community out there of houses that were built because of this joint mission. We're coming together to try to, try to take care of, uh, of each other in that way. Um, you can go all around the world to see how We've got these massive hospital systems and districts and, and, and all of that. All of that has been the blessing of our being together, bringing our resources together, and trying to uh, make a difference in the world and care for the world. So these ministries have, um, have been such a blessing at, at, even to young people and as we've been on their faith journeys, I've I'm, I'm got my notes, so I can't forget to remember confirmation and youth programs. Just the list is so very long. This sense of mission was working in our earlier versions of, of us. There were Methodists who came not far from here. When we were, uh, there was a little, uh, there was a little, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 I guess it was like a, an encampment that was put together of, of former slaves, I believe. Uh, and uh, it was out not far from here in, in a place called Hood's Point. And in Hood's Point, out here about, not about between here and Gonzales, a little bit more north out there, the Methodists came out there and put a church. It happened in the late 80s, somewhere in there. Uh, these newly freed slaves, and they were out there. They, did, they, they were not slaves anymore. They were newly freed, and they were out there trying to make a life for themselves. The Methodists planted a church out there. There was a church out there that supported 
with the local help and supported that church and let it build up. And it was back out there, my father was born in, in 1990. And in 1990, uh, I'm done well, 1990. <laughs> boy, he, boy he, he would have really been, no, 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 no. That, good God. I'm, uh, 1900, 1900, 1900. Thank you, I'm so, forgive me for that. I'm a little nervous. But 1900 was when my dad was born. And he was born right out there in this place in Hood's Point, not far from here. Now, and, and I'm telling you this story, this is very important to me. He, you know, it was out there running around. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping to get back, back soon to see it, you know. That church is where he worshiped and the family worshiped, the youngest of 11 children. And of that group of the children, the youngest, he was the one out there, he was about 11 or 12 years old, he got his call to, to be a pastor. He had to move and go to school and everything. But then he ended up being a pastor and serving for 52 years into his retirement uh, in, as a Methodist pastor at those times. Now here, comes, here I come along. Uh, and, and I was born in 1961, and, man, and, um, and, and, and here I am now. And I'm in my, I'm in my 31st year as a, as, a, as, a, as a pastor in appointment as a United Methodist pastor. And through, I'm, I'm still talking about this mission of, the, of, the, of our, our, our Methodist church. Um, I grew up in parsonages. Uh, I, 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 I'm a, I was a student. I was confirmed in our church. I was confirmed. I learned about the Lord, you know, following my dad around, going to church. I lived in a church. Then um, I attended school at Houston Tillerson University, Houston Tillerson College in Austin, which is a place that we supported. We have supported all these years that college there. And, uh, and that's how I got my degree there. And then I went to seminary. And the seminary I went to is Southern Methodist University. That's one of our schools, too, uh, Perkins School of Theology. And I got my degree there, both, all of my degrees, my doctorate degree. I got all that from Southern Methodist University, Perkins School of Theology. And this, this, this uh, you know, I, I'm just trying to say so my story in this is, is, is this is where I am and who I am. I am what I am. Uh, spiritually, in my walk with the Lord, in my walk with you, because of what the Methodist Church has meant in my life. And so um, that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm with it, good or bad, ups, ups or downs. Uh, uh, there have been some bad ones. This is a tough one now. Uh, but, but I just wanted to let you know just a little sense of how, what is the result of all of those years, all of those years of... Uh, of, uh, of, of contributions and apportionments and pooling on resources. Uh, I'm not saying I'm a good example at all. Please, I know yeah, some things about me, a lot of things about me are not, does not, do not add up, I know. But I'm just saying, you know, uh, there's been some good that's come from all that we've done. I want to thank you. I want to thank you all for those years that you have, you, you've contributed uh, to help make lives and empower lives like mine. Um, but regretfully now, okay, um, we've come to a denominational impasse, as we call it, you know, a crossroad, if you will, that about the inclusion of and ministry with LGBTQ people with the United Methodist Church. For several decades, the general conference sessions have sought to address the issue with no success. In this time, that we've been in existence as we united since 1968. Um, remember I told you about we had this way of thinking about uh, theology and how we think about God from a broad perspective. But that's what we've tried to be. That's what we've tried to live. There's been a lot of good that's done. But all along that same time, there have been some who have not been completely happy with, not completely happy with, uh, some of the decisions and the ways of interpreting or understanding that we have arrived at. One of them is, has been the presence of people who, of who are homosexual, people who are of the LGBTQ community. That has been a problem. And from that very beginning back there in 1968, ever since then, there's been some controversy about it. 
Uh, there have been those who are members of the LGBTQ community who have wanted to be a part of the United Methodist Church. Uh, there have been, and they wanted to be more involved, there have been some from the, uh, who in the church have, who have completely not wanted to accept that. Uh, the, the, all through the years, every time there's been a general conference meeting, um, um, the church has leaned traditional in its beliefs and has voted traditional and has maintained traditional values uh, such as, you know, marriage is a union between a man and a woman and that uh, uh, homosexuality is not consistent uh, with scripture. That's, that's, that's been a part of what we believe. That's in our book of discipline. That's what, you know, what we're, what we're, how we're designed. Um, uh, marriages are not allowed, uh, same-sex marriages are not allowed in, by United Methodist pastors or in United Methodist sanctuary. That's in our book of discipline right now. That's how we, we, we believe. And uh, um, homosexual persons who are homo pra uh, practicing, self-avowed practicing homosexual persons are not allowed to be ordained or, or become ordained pastors. That's something that we, we, we believe that's in our book of discipline. That's what we uphold. And there have been some who have been in that community or supporting the LGBTQ community who have been advocating to, that they're saying that that's wrong. That's not being inclusive. Not, not, that's not bringing us together. And they've been advocating for it. And there have been others who have been saying, we need to, you know, we need to follow scripture. We need to maintain scripture. We need to do what the Bible says. And this has been, this is our impasse. This has been our problem. And um, um, uh, so at, at 2019, a special session, uh, this came to a head, and a special session of this general conference, people from all over the world had, can't, had to come and try to deal with this. And, um, and they, they put up this plan that we're going to be talking about here for the next, uh, from now on for our, for our meeting to help churches that, uh, they, hope to, they hope to resolve it. They hope to have a plan that's going to resolve it. Uh, some, of the, some, some possibilities have been, one possibility has been to kind of like divide the denomination and have a denomination for those to be a part of, 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 of a more, more traditional conservative uh, component of our denomination. And there's been another uh, I, 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 uh, side of the denomination that will be more, um, more progressive, you know, more liberal in their, in their understanding. There's been a, you know, a hope to do all that in these general conference in 2019, but they couldn't resolve it. So they came up with this policy for those who couldn't wait, you know, those who couldn't wait. That's why we're here today. So this is for those who couldn't wait, those who have been growing weary of it. And they were going to, that was temporary until the actual conference in 2020, when some other things were going to happen. Now, there's a whole lot about that we can come into, get into later. Um, but then the pandemic hit. When the pandemic hit in 2020, as you know, they had to delay the meeting. They could not go on with, with the plan. It got delayed again and again because people from overseas couldn't travel and get here. The visas couldn't be done. The uh, travel has been, everything's been in, in, you know, chaos. And so now General Conference is delayed, as you know, until 2024 next year when they hope to, they hope to resolve. They hope that that resolution will come. But what has happened is, with all of the delays, with all the delays that every, we've been experiencing, um, there are some who've grown tired. And they said, we just, they, don't want, we just, they don't want to wait. They don't want to wait any longer. They don't want to go through it any longer. They don't want to go through the process of, of hoping it will work out, hoping that the, there'll be an end to this. And so uh, a new, two, actually two, the two, New denominations have begun to be formed, but the, but the main the main one is a more conservative denomination, a more more traditional in their thinking. And that's called the Global Methodist Church, right? And so I know I know this is not new to you, uh, some of you, but uh, the Global Methodist Church began. Now the Global Methodist Church began to promote uh, the church uh, once they launched in, in May, I think May first of this year. 
And so the promotion began. They began to promote, began to recruit um, in some ways. It's been like a recruitment. And um, a lot of information has gone out over the Internet, uh, lifting up and really encouraging why we have to act, why we must act, why we must disaffiliate, why churches that feel that they have more traditional values must, must join the Global Methodist Church now Things that about the United Methodist Church is why we have to leave it now, why there's no more hope, why, why um, um, there, there's no trust. I mean, there's a long list of, of um, concerns and complaints that have been raised up, and uh, it, it got pretty intense. And uh, it got to a place for a while that it was coming so, uh, so uh, you know, you had to kind of begin to really look at it and read it you know, to be sure that, you know, it was, it was, it was coming so hard and, and it, it, it was getting pretty rough. And, and, and some of it, there were questions about some of the things that were being said very, um, very quite, quite a bit. We, we'll, we'll get into some of that later. But uh, on the same, so on the same note, what, what, um, there are many who have begun to say, to, 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 to really think deeply about whether or not they really need to stay. And... Um, the only, the, the quickest, the most available way to consider that has been to, you know, reading all the information, the videos out there, leaders who have been advocating for this. Um, uh, it's the quickest way to consider it is to consider disaffiliating. And this process that I'm going to be telling you about here is a, is a way that that 2019 General Conference offered to make disaffiliation possible. So, uh, where we are now then is um, um, our sincere, sincere desire, uh, I will say, on behalf of the bishop, uh, me, me for sure, uh, on behalf of the conference, the United Methodist Church, the sincere desire of the church is to continue, is, is that we try, you know, to, to find a way. The bishop will say, as he said in his video, there's a place for you in the United Methodist Church. The United Methodist Church continues to want to try to be a place that is serving a broad, diverse people because that's kind of who we are from the very beginning. Uh, we came together from, now you know there are churches in, 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 uh, in, in countries, Africa and South America and, and Asia and Europe Imagine all of the different perspectives from the different communities. Uh, they, they're all a part of this church. That does include some who, are, who have beliefs and systems that are not comfortable for some of us. Uh, there are some extreme beliefs that are difficult for some of us, and we, we, some of us we can't, couldn't bear those. But we are that broad spectrum. And uh, that is, that's who we are, and our bishop, in, as, as kind of said, I think he's been around, going around to all of the different uh, districts. And uh, some of you, I think, maybe it were at one of the meetings with uh, the bishop when he came around. He was in, in uh, Victoria recently. One of the things he said, and he, his is his hope, you know, that uh, we will continue to be a diverse church. I mean, this is going to be the reality. That's who the United Methodist Church is, where people work alongside each other uh, despite their differences. He, this is his quote. He says, we will offer Christ at our communities, at all of our communities. Our doors and hearts will always be open to those who seek a relationship with Jesus Christ and seek refuge of his church. A church which Christ is open to people of all ages, nations, and races. We will uh, welcome uh, conservatives. We will welcome progressive. We will welcome traditionalists. And we will welcome liberals and centrists, or whatever, however we designate ourselves. Um, every single person will be invited into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Um, so um, that's the hope for what the United Methodist Church will be. Think about what the United Methodist Church could become. Well, we're learning a lot. You know, in my, in my, I'm in my uh, sixth year. Um, in, I'll be in um, June, July of this coming, of next year, I will be year six for me. And so after that many years, 
from when we started, the way we made appointments, um, there were some very standard questions. We wanted to know what the church wanted in a pastor and what, what you thought would be the best qualities, what your community might need. Um, and we would, we would ask those kind of basic questions. But now, in the last couple of years, especially what we're doing is we're asking questions like, well, now, what, what is your church stand ideologically? Uh, are you more traditional? Or are you more, uh, are you any, are you more, are you more uh, 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 progressive in thinking? Maybe more, are you more conservative? Are you more liberal? Uh, what what do you, what you, would you want in a pastor? And pastors are, we find are in different places. Some pastors lean, you know, pastors have ways we lean as well. Some pastors are more traditional, more conservative, and they're firm in that. Other pastors are much more, much more liberal, much more uh, progressive in their thinking and open in their thinking in that way. Um, our hope is that a pastor will, will be able to lean in a third from the middle and be able to lead from the middle, you know, and be able to uh, lead in a way where they offer Christ to all people, to all, because uh, it, it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's hard yet to experience any complete congregation where absolutely everybody is in the same exact place uh, about everything. Uh, if you're going to be a leader of many people, we, we, we try, with the goal, the hope, and what we're learning is, you know, to train pastors, hopefully, who can have a capacity to share God's love with anybody, no matter where they are, and to, um, you know, be able to uh, uh, let, let the Holy Spirit work and move in the hearts of, of individuals, and, and let, let God uh, 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 do the healing, let God uh, bring, like Paul says, uh, uh, Paul said in the, in the scripture, he said, he planted, I planted Apollo's water, but it is God who gives the increase. So it's the Holy Spirit work, do its work, but to offer Christ at all. But we know the reality is sometimes pastors are in one side and they're in one, this is how they feel, strong, excuse me, strongly about one particular, a particular extreme. And that's okay. I mean, that, that, that's who we are as the United Methodist Church. We, we, we accept pastors with extreme beliefs. We, to, the extent, to a certain extent, within the limits of our, of our, um, of our denominations and guideline, guidelines. Uh, but what we would not do is send a pastor who is, believes opposite. We're learning not to send a pastor who believes opposite from what you, your, your congregation says uh, you primarily are. We would never send a pastor who is not, you know, uh, if, if your congregation is more conservative, we won't send a liberal pastor to your congregation. That's not going to be good for you, of course, because, the, because of what the pastor's positions are, what their stances are, how they believe, how they feel, what they advocate for. That would just be uncomfortable for you the whole time. But it would also be uncomfortable for that pastor and that pastor's family if they were constantly being, you know, being rejected, everything they say and did. We don't want the pastors to fail. We don't want them to fail, but we don't want you to fail. We don't want it to be bad for you. And um, this, 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 uh, this has gotten bitter. This has gotten hard. This has gotten uh, 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 really difficult. It, it, it's played out all in the news, all in the public, on the national scene. Uh, it, it's, it's really gotten bad. And uh, we have a lot of pastors who are deciding no longer to be in ministry because of it. There are some who are saying to them that they don't want to be involved. They don't, they, 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 you know, they, they're, they're worried and afraid about this. It's, it's really hard. This is a difficult time that we're in. But we still have a charge. We still have a responsibility. And we, we are learning that that's going to be the only hope we have of going forward. That's one of the hopes of figuring out how to live together in the future. So um, despite all of this, though, we know that uh, it, it's, it's, it's realistic to acknowledge that separation by some congregation is inevitable. It's going to happen, okay? And um, it is our hope that we continue to treat one another with grace and respect as we move into this time. 
So as we're going through this, uh, it'll have a lot to do with how we talk to each other and how we treat each other. And as the bishop was saying, remembering that someone is in our congregation among our family who may not feel like we feel about it. You may feel really strong about something, but they may feel completely different. And that is serious. And this is a part of our family that doesn't feel like the rest of us feel. So, 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 so how, we, how we talk to one another, how we engage one another. Um, uh, sometimes we're disagreeing. How can we, okay, I don't like dis agree to disagree because that really never, you know, that, I mean, that's not community, but, but maybe that's one thing where you look at it. Or, or, or how we talk, or how we, we, we speak as best we can to understand uh, without uh, being, uh, uh, without, without, uh, do no harm. Do all the good you can, as John Wesley says. Uh, uh, stay in love with God. That's what John Wesley, our founder, says. How do we be with someone who does not believe like we believe as much and, 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 um, and still do no harm? What happens if we choose, if you choose to go and to leave or to disaffiliate? Um, and uh, how, do we, how do we put in motion whatever it is we will do to ensure that um, if there are some who do not want to do that, uh, what do we do to ensure that they don't leave? They just, they, just, they just don't want to be involved. They feel overwhelmed. They feel unloved. Um, you know, what is, you know, so I just, I just, uh, just offering some reflections or thoughts about as we go forward, um, um, there is a hope that we can be fair and be loving in the process. You know, we'll still be neighbors no matter what happens, you know. Uh, uh, we're neighbors with other denominations now, right? There's some Baptists not far away. There's some Catholics not far away. And so uh, that, uh, maybe some other denominations uh, and... Um, uh, if, 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 if a, a disaffiliation occurs, maybe um, we can be uh, still uh, Christian brothers and sisters as different versions of Wesleyan uh, religion, denomin whatever denomination we choose, or whatever way we choose to go, maybe we can still be in some ways uh, friends um, a a as well. But um, anyway, we don't know how this is going to turn out, but um, we want you to, to reflect with us. This process allows us to reflect on how we can, if it becomes that we part ways, how we can do so uh, with grace, with love, and to help, you know, help as, as the conference wants to make this not a hard transition for those who want to disaffiliate. The conference is asking and hoping that those who want to disaffiliate will help lighten the burden a little bit for the conference as well. The conference does not want to be an enemy in this. But we want to be as cordial and as friendly as we can if that were to happen. Um, I don't know uh, the value of your property, um, I, 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 but, you know, I, I, the, 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 someone asked me the other day, I asked someone the, the other day, and the value of their, of their property was a million dollars. And um, we're going to talk about what this plan, uh, this disaffiliation plan, dollar-wise, is going to be the equivalent of a, two years of apportionment, as well as a, um, an amount uh, for a, um, a pension responsibility, deferred pension responsibility, that helps take care of pension of all retired clergy and pastors. And, and those who, going who are, who are, are, are already retired and their spouses who survived them and are with them. And just a portion, a portion of what that will be for the rest of our lives, you know, as, as that's, that's a promise, a guarantee of but we go, a policy that we, we go into with uh, all pastors uh, who are part, of, are part of this system, is that we will be with them, we will be a part of this uh, defined or deferred this pension plan, defined pension plan uh, for the rest of their lives. And this, the plan is, is, is only possible as churches pay their part in, uh, pastors pay their part, and then the conference pays its part. And the conference's responsibility 
is a combination of all of that that goes on for years and years and for as long as the pastor lives. And that, that just asking for a, a portion, a projected portion of what that might be from your church. Just a little bit of that, that usually equates about five or six years maybe of, of apportionment as opposed to the value of the building, which is probably more than, more, before, ten times more than that maybe. Um, maybe even more than ten times. But just the way, if it's going to happen, if, it, if it's inevitable, how can we, how can we do so in a way that is gracious and kind and helps the part go a little bit more, parting go a little bit smoother for everybody? So um, we're going to walk through the process here in a minute. We've been here about an hour, I mean, 20, 50 minutes so far. And uh, um, before we begin, uh, I want to just you know stop. I've been talking. Talked a long time. I, 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 that, wow. And, uh, and I know it's, uh, um, it's a bit the early morning here, but I wanted to just uh, ask you if you, if you uh, uh, have any questions for me. I, I have a little handout for you. We, we're going to get to a move to a transition to a time now where I'm going to begin to talk about the policy. I can move right into that. Uh, or I want to ask you if you just have any questions about anything I've said so far. I know that this has been a, a lot coming at you. I've been talking a long time, and, uh, and uh, you may have had some thoughts going through your mind, something I said that, you know, probably, probably you know, sparked a thought, um, but, um, but you'd like to clarify that now. Uh, do, do, do we need a break? Are y'all okay? Do you need a break? Would you like to take a, like about five minutes, or do you want to go on? Or are y'all Okay. You want to take five? Okay, let's take five, and when we come back, I'm going to uh, come back and start a whole new new little section of it, okay? Thank you all for your patience and for, for your kindness. Hi, are you doing okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get in there. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It, it, the, there's some other issues. Yes, ma'am. There's some other issues that are, that are, that are leading up to it. Yes, ma'am. I'll, 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 I'll certainly, I'll certainly get to that. Yeah. Good morning. Hey, how are we you? Thank you for coming and, uh, and sharing sharing your time with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I always I always enjoy coming yes. here. I really I have do. A question. Yes, ma'am. You began sharing about how the church should have a vision. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any other issues in terms of God regarding that? That's, that's what she was asking me. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay.
I'll ask how many times I got in trouble with that. <laughs> anyway, all right, thank you. Well, okay. Oh, yeah, I could have been. All right, I'm going to pass some things around here. Oh, you remind me? Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll go on the other side there. Okay. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go over here and take some. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Excuse me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me. Let's get. Hey guys, can y'all hear me? Okay. Hear me now? Yeah. All right. I spent most of my life at the Episcopal Church, and we tragically went through something similar there. Uh, the first time we had a change to the prayer book, a lot of people stepped away from serving in the church. Um, and about 20 years ago, the same week, same question. Uh, people, Christians, from when I walked this path, wanted to get affiliated, but we discovered uh, the similar situation where Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you so much. Absolutely, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great questions. Those are right to the those questions. You cut right to the core and heart of uh, what many of our sisters and brothers have issues with uh, with the church. Uh, and uh, uh, some of this, uh, I'll give a little questionnaire. I gave you that. Uh, I gave you that to, for the purpose of start burning out questions, uh, getting to questions like this, so we can have a time to share. And uh, the first question about following the books of book of discipline and the rules. 
Um, if you allow me to try to pr frame my answer to that, please, I'm going to try to frame my answer around uh, how we're structured as a, as a, as a denomination. I'm going to try to do it as quick as I can. I'm going to try to be too, I'm going to try, sometimes I can get long-winded, but if you think about the, the United Methodist Church, the best, a good example to understand how the United Methodist Church is structured is to look at the United States Constitution and how the United States government is structured. The United States government has a judicial con uh, branch, a legislative branch, and a, um, yes, yes, okay, and uh, the, the, that's the government, that's the government. In the United uh, Methodist Church, we have the bishops that make up the executive, we have the general conference that meets every four years that writes our rules and book of discipline. They make up kind of like the legislative. And then we have a judicial council that makes, it's like the, it's made up of nine people and it operates like the Supreme Court, okay? Now, just it, all, all of the, the, the government is designed, the United States government is designed to uphold the Constitution. And cases come day in and day out from cases, the, the question as to whether or not someone has done something uh, 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 to violate the Constitution. That's, that's what the Judicial Council does. That's the same thing as the, as the, uh, as the, uh, you know, the Supreme Court. The legislative branch, you know, like the senators and the Congress uh, persons and all of those, they make laws based upon what's happening on the ground, what people's needs are. Sometimes people, there's a law in place or a rule, and they, um, they'll say they don't feel like that law applies to them anymore. They want to challenge it. They want to challenge it. They'll call their senator. They'll call their, uh, you know, their Congress person, whoever that is, and advocate to change it. Um, and so, so... Uh, some some violate the law. They just don't do it. They just violate the law. You know, we know that how that works, right? And uh, that can that's not good at all because that's outside. But if you look at what's going on now, as I was sharing earlier, we are a broad church, and there are some who are pretty strong, firm, and more traditional values. Some pre form and more progressive values, and uh, the, the way the rules in our book of discipline are right now, they lean more traditional, right? But there are those on the more progressive side, those who are more of the liberal belief system, they, uh, they're, they're fighting for more inclusion. They want the book of discipline and the rules to be more inclusive, more open. Uh, they're feeling more left out. And uh, so what ends up happening is... Uh, we, this has been a part of our big struggle. Now, the bishops, as I was sharing earlier, like, like pastors, I hope we, we, were, we, we are trying to be, is we try to be a leader for everybody. We're trying to be a leader for everybody. So uh, there are people who are so feeling so left out, so their, their way of dealing with it is they're going to violate the rules if they can. And... Uh, uh, that, that's been one extreme. Another extreme now, on, on the other end of our, our more traditional side, they said, many of our traditional brothers and sisters have said, we're just not going to fight anymore. We're going to just leave. That, that's in a reaction to all of this as well. Um, and so uh, in the middle of this, the bishops are trying to figure out a way to lead. And one of the proposals that came before the, the, uh, uh, the 2019, well, be, would, would have come, for the 2020 or the 2021 uh, conference, I think 2022, is something called the Protocol for Reconciliation uh, to Grace or something like that. And in that, it said that until we resolve this issue, um, charges and things against people who violate the rules will be held in abeyance. And so there, if there's someone who violates the rules, and people have been doing that, but... Um, the bishops, some of the bishops, not all of them, some of them are going forward with it, but some have said, okay, we're going to, 
wait and see if the general conference can resolve this for us and come up with some way to let those who want to do the more, have freedom to do the more liberal uh, functions and practice religion in their way will be free to do that. And then those who want to practice more traditional values will be free to that. that that's a hope. But to, but to hold any charges uh, until then. So again, we're at a place where that's not enough to wait. You know, waiting until 2024 is hard for, for many. Um, but there, there's a hope that, that some answer will come there, but we can't know. We don't know. Uh, but um, um, so it's just really a time, I think, where the laws and the rules of the church uh, around that issue are being tested uh, 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 by some who don't, who feel like they want them to represent something different. And, um, and I'm, I'm trying to be as nice as I can about it, you know, because I'm, I'm trying to be as objective as I can. But that's, that's, that's one of the uh, parts of your question. The best I can give is an answer. I know it's not, I know it's not, I know it's not the best answer, but, but it's, if, if, if we're in a time where we're trying to solve this problem, what will we be as the United Methodist Church? How will we deal with these broad, broadly different views? And, and that's what we've been trying to figure out for 50 years. That's what we're trying to, we, we're at a point where we've got to do something now. And we don't know until that group gets together in 24 what they're going to do. In the meantime, churches are not, the other, the other misconception, I think, in the promotion of the Global Methodist Church, they've been saying, and I understand that, because to, they launch, the church launch, and they really need to, well, they have some thresholds they need to, they want to make. They want to be successful. Um, and the bishop has said, we all want any church open in the name of the Lord to be successful for saving souls. We want them to be successful. Um, uh, but um, um, part of what is kind of concerning to me, uh, and for you know, it, it, it's been some of the really strong tactics that have been used, and some of them have been to say to all of us, to those who would, who would hear, that you have to do this now. If you don't do this now, you'll never get a chance again. If you don't do this now, you might lose everything you have. If you don't do this now, this. If you don't do this now, that. And it created this sense of urgency that many are, that, that's a part of the reason why we're, we're, we're here now, because part of the reason why so many of our churches are, are feeling they need to act now before the, the time runs out, before the policy expires. I'll tell you, talk about that in just a moment. And when reality is, when that policy expires, um, the, our trustees have already come up with a way that that the same things in it, will, if, if they are observed, will still go forward with allowing you to disaffiliate under the same terms. It's not, it's not a rush that, that, that everyone's saying, you got to do this by now because six months, between, you be sure you get going before the annual conference and all of that. And that's true. That's good. And if you really want to do that, yes, okay, no problem. But, you know, the sense of urgency is a part of the campaign, I believe, just maybe, I may be wrong, but to, you know, to, I guess it's a strong effort to, you know, promote the church. And just like any promotion, you know, it's really strong. And, and, and it does appeal to our, our senses and, and, and to our, uh, it appeals to our, our hearts, our wants, our needs. Um, um, I, a question earlier, uh, what came, I came, if I may address, uh, I see, sir, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the man behind you, uh, the question, and then, and then we talk back here also in the back, over here about other issues that have been brought up. And I can't remember them all, but one of them has to do with uh, uh, um, uh, a, a trust of the bishops and the leaders, district superintendents, those not honoring the Book of Discipline or not holding people accountable. It's accountability is another one related to that. Other issues that people are, have been upset about, maybe you'll be able to help me better with this, but, 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 uh, but, but in order, you know, beyond the homosexuality issue, other issues uh, that have been raised have been like um, um, a concern about how some have interpreted 
um, a scripture and how they've interpreted the beliefs about about what scripture says and why if they don't believe what they don't live by exactly what they they're reading how they're reading scripture then they're wrong they're wrong by that and uh, so remember I said how there are different interpretations and there's some who are saying well why why aren't they living this interpretation but there are other beliefs that uh, that, that people are, are mentioning is about some things that those who are extreme are saying on this far very uh, liberal side. They're saying things like uh, they don't believe in the divinity of Jesus. They're saying they don't believe in a virgin birth. They're saying things like that about the theology and beliefs that have been the hallmarks of our church and our faith. And uh, and uh, and these are those who are on that very far extreme end. Uh, who are I believe I don't know why they're saying things like that. Maybe maybe you know they they have a system of beliefs that leads them. I don't know. I don't know. But what has happened is that has become associated with the whole United Methodist Church because of the, I believe maybe it's tied to the campaign. But those who are promoting us to leave and us to dismantle are, are lifting up everything. They're lifting up everything. When the, when the policy that we're here by is, a, is the issue of the homosexuality, but all the other issues are coming to the surface, issues that, that many have with the church. Many, many are concerned about uh, the property issue, uh, the issue of the trust clause, and, and, and many are concerned about that, and, and how the fact that, that all churches, the Methodist churches, uh, the property is owned by the trustees in trust, that by the, by the, by the conference and, 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 and maintained and owned by the trustees locally and the conference's hold on it is only in trust that the property will always be used to serve the purposes of the church. That's basically it, to serve the mission of the denomination of the church, and wh which is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And uh, that's been an issue uh, because that means really at the, uh, uh, on, on record that means that if you look at your deed, it's going to say, it's going to have your, the name of your church on it, but it's going to be saying held in trust by the Real Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church or by the United Methodist Church. Somewhere that clause will be in there. And some are not happy with that. Um, there's a lot more that I can't even begin to answer. That and when you, when in a time like this, um, many things that our brothers and sisters are unhappy with about our denomination have risen to the surface. And, uh, and um, that's kind of how, how, part of how we get here. I don't know if I've answered any of your questions. I, I've just been all over the place. Can, can, I, can you clarify something you might need more? Mm-hmm. 
okay, we're going to let folks do what they want. We're trying to bring them all together and keep them all happy. Mm-hmm. And, and you've got the, the believers that it is the infallible word, mm-hmm. and we don't want to change. We know what the Bible says. We don't need to wait for a conference to mm-hmm. tell That's me right. what the Bible believes. Right. And I think this is where the church is failing the congregation mm-hmm. in that they're not taking a strong enough stance because they're afraid of what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. They're afraid of lawsuits or separations of the individuals that don't believe in the Bible as the Bible. Mm-hmm. And you can't change it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. that uh, and, uh, you know, and it's a choice to be going through this. I mean, I agree with you. And, and even now, um, what you choose to do in your congregation, how you choose to structure your congregation, how you choose to base your beliefs, how you worship God, how you believe in the Bible. Well, nobody's uh, saying that anyone has to do any of that. But basically what's happening is we're at a place where we are feeling uh, the weight of the whole world on our shoulders. You never have had to change any way that you study the Bible and how you teach, how your pastor preaches, what you believe, and how you function and live your life as a Christian. That None of that has had to change. But what's happened is many who are United Methodists have known, have grown to a place where they don't want, it's really about what do you want, wanting to be associated with those who are believing in a different, a different level in a different way. And so it's really, right now, uh, as we speak right now, your church has the ability or capability of saying we are a conservative congregation. We are not going to believe, we're not going to honor this, honor that, and do that. And, um, and uh, the, the, the thing that, that, becomes a challenge when you hold that position in a denomination like this is, for instance, you know, you have to ask yourself about uh, how you support other components of the denomination, right? And, uh, you know, and that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a choice that we make. Uh, uh, but being a part of it does mean there's an association with a denomination that believes in a broad way. And I believe maybe that's the issue. There are many who don't want to be associated with that. With that. But the but the keeps pushing it out and pushing it out. And the technology today, they mm-hmm. just have webinars and things like that or FaceTime or whatever they call it, you know, mm-hmm. and have and resolve these issues mm-hmm. before, you know, it, long before it's gotten to where it is today. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? So it's just a point I wanted to make. Good point, and, good uh, point, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. And uh, so that's where we are. And uh, we, you know, the decision to make a vote is yours. If you choose to vote, then you're just a choice you made, and, and you're being supported in that. If that's the route to go, but the, the policy I'm going to talk about here in a minute is asking uh, a, a for offering a process for which that to happen. If you don't vote. You do remain United Methodist. You are, that is the banner across, that's, that's this, you know, we are still that denomination. So it doesn't mean you become what you don't like about the church. It means you can, you can still be who you are. It's, it's what, what we're trying to say and hope for. 
what the future is going to be with that, we don't know. And, uh, and uh, so I, I, I appreciate what you shared. And uh, that was very honest and true. And, and that's kind of it sums up very well where we are. Uh, I'm, uh, I don't know if I was able to respond to that well. But, but yes, sir. Yes, sir. General conference about, yes, sir. You know, having, you know, conservative by the or the liberal progressive by the church. But that's already been proposed at the 2019. Mm -hmm. That's the one church plan, and that was rejected. That was rejected, yes. Yeah, the, pro the, the protocol for set reconciliation, the great, that, that was, uh, that's been the next one. But when the Global Methodist Church stepped away, the, and these are those who are more conservative and more who more traditional in their beliefs. When they stepped away, decided that they no longer you know want and began to join, form the their new denomination. There have been many who have begun to leave the United Methodist Church who've been voting to disaffiliate. So the numbers of those who were, who were present uh, to continue that conversation to try to create uh, negotiate from a traditional uh, conservative point of view might be impacted by those who are leaving because a good number of them are making that decision. Um, that's going to impact the conversation and the outcome. Uh, but then the other one, the global message, the, 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 uh, the, the protocol when the global message church left, it was also going to be offer ways for there to be a more, a more, uh, a, a, right, ma'am, it was going to offer ways for there to be a more liberal side of uh, a way of thinking and a more conservative way of thinking. But when that, when that, when the global message church started, that began to create a reaction by those who are more liberal, more who are more uh, progressive, who said that they no longer support that. So now we're going to go to a 20 general conference in 2024, fresh and new, with, a whole, with an opportunity for all new proposals to come before us. What will the outcome be with that broad range of thinking there? Um, um, I don't know. We, none of us know. Um, all we are doing is hoping. We know that that is the only place that can determine what the United Methodist Church will be. So far, for all the 50 years, they have leaned more traditional. Uh, every year, every time something has come up, that's been where it's leaned. What will happen now um, with more of our uh, uh, conservative traditional members uh, not there. Then some other things have happened with the delegates. Some of the delegates now, more of them are perhaps more progressive in thinking, but, but we don't know how, how much, how many more. We don't know what the numbers are going to be or anything. We don't know what's going to happen. But our, many of us who are still United Methodists are praying for that to happen, something to happen there that will help us. I'm sorry, ma'am. New, 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 I, I, well, I, I want to honor, if I may, your, your thought about that, but it is a new denomination. It is no longer, see, the Global Methodist Church is, is going gonna, gonna to change everything for those who, who re disaffiliate and join it. It means you're going to have to unincorporate as the United Methodist Church. It means you have to remove everything United Methodist from all of your... Uh, 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 from the deeds and property, the United Methodist emblem from the banner and, and all of your uh, promotional material, you will become used then, but then you will use all of the, the logos and all of the uh, uh, promotional materials that come from the Global Methodist Church. It is a denomination separate, completely separate from the United Methodist Church.
Yeah. See, I understand how you feel that way. But I, I, I want to go back, though, and remember, when you change a denomination, it, it's a legal thing. We, we, we're not asking you to move. We want you to stay and remain United Methodist. But when, if, you're, if a church makes a choice to move, then you, it's a whole different legal uh, 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 entity. And you ha the, by, by, by law and rule, you can't continue to you know, promote United, the United Methodist emblem or anything United Methodist if you are a global Methodist. Global Methodist Church has a beautiful logo. They have a beautiful, it's a global and a cross there. And that would be you, you, what you would become. And uh, it is a legal thing. It is a change that happens. We don't want it to, to be. We don't, that's why we don't want you to go through all that and make all those changes. But that is the reality when you change an affiliation and association. And um, uh, I'm trying to think there's something I wanted to say about this. Uh, the second part of what you shared. Oh, my God, I've just lost it. Uh, uh, you said the last thing you said. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, the appointments. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I know how you feel that way. I know there's been some rough ones. I, I imagine in your history you can remember some pretty difficult appointments. I, I, I myself have been a part of some that I really, really, really wish had gone better. Um, and, um, and as I was sharing, all I was saying is that we're learning. And I know the past has been one thing, but we are learning that if we're going to try to be the church in the future, we've got to be much more sensitive to this. You know, and, uh, uh, you know, there's no way, in the, I think you, uh, your pastor is retiring. I don't know what his plans are. He'll still be remaining. I don't know what, what we're going to do. I have no idea. I haven't begun to talk about it. Do you all know that he's retiring, by the way? I, I hope I didn't. <laughs> oh, me and my big mouth. I'm just talking. I'm, but, uh, but, but, you know, we love Pastor Paul. You know, he, he's a very delight among us. But I'm saying we, we, we wouldn't send you. Someone who's who to a church, you know, that here like yours. We know we know your community is a more conservative community and traditional in your beliefs, and we we couldn't send you someone who couldn't live up to that. We just couldn't do that. We know now from the past that this is how the future has got to be. Now, whether or not we are, you know, you know, I can speak for myself, but I can't speak for the one that's going to follow me. I can't speak for anyone else. I know you're some, there have been some difficult experiences. I know there are some, some times when this hasn't happened. Right? One more thing I want to say is that, as I should also say, is that there is a shortage of pastors. You know, over these recent years, and particularly with what's going on now, you know, this is the first year at annual conference. We only had two persons ordained as elders in our conference. And, and my class, when I was ordained back in 1991 or two, I think it was, we had like about... 13 or 15. It's been that way every year since then. It's up to 8 or 10 or 15 or 12. We not we don't have. I, I, I wonder what it what's going on with our whole denomination. It's not you, but it's what's going on all around. You know, that's how attractive that even is to a person who's wanting to go into the ministry and serve. You know, they're wondering. I'm, 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 we're, we're seeing it. I'm seeing it all the time. I don't know. The pastors are leaving. They're some of them are not retiring at retirement age. Some are retiring at early ages. Some are changing and leaving the ministry because this is very stressful. The pastor doesn't know what the future is in the midst of all of this. So, so we will be also working with a shortage of pastors, and it's going to be a, quite a road ahead. I'm sorry, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. I agree. I agree with you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's, it's a question of the trust and, 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 and accountability of the leadership for sure. You're, you're absolutely right, sir. Absolutely right. Yes, sir.
Right. Is his knowledge. Yeah. So why are we saying as the United Methodists, you got to be flexible and you got to do this and that? We're in the Bible. We should be following that. Yes, sir. People that don't like it should not be Methodists That's or right. at least United Methodists. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they should not be in any form or fashion, you know, preachers or bishops or anything else. They should come in and set the congregation as sinners because all sinners are welcome. Yes, sir. Yes, I don't care flexibility in that. You, what you, you think that Jesus was here today, you know, he would say, okay, I want to marry a man? Huh. Think about this. I mean, we are uh, supposed to be Christians, mm -hmm. and that is what the United Methodists are supposed to represent. Yes. And right now, for what you're saying, they're not. You're talking about flexibility in this, mm -hmm. and when couples don't get along, they get a divorce. And that's basically Divorces from mm -hmm. the United Methodists. Mm -hmm. They're going their separate ways. Yeah, that's so right. So that's yeah. what's happening. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's, I mean, people can talk all they want. Right. But if you're truly a Christian, you believe the Bible, mm -hmm. all the rest of it is full. That's right. Okay. And uh, yeah. that's, that's it. I mean, that's, 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 there's nothing that's, else to be said. That's right. I mean, if United Methodists don't want to go to that, then they probably... Right. Well, I, I accept that. Um, I, there's nothing I can say about that. I mean, you said it very well, and uh, you, you're speaking the beliefs and heart of so many. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, as far as I'm concerned, that's it. I mean, you got yeah. the Bible, and that's it. Yes, sir. That's right. You don't go change it. I, I, I just don't, I don't have a response against it. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I agree with you. I mean, I, I believe that, and I wish that I do wish that we weren't having to have this kind of conversation. You know, the United Methodist Church has, again, always tried. Scripture is at the top, you know, but it's just, I guess, I guess the thing that is dividing us is that there are people who are, who are living on lives, a different experience of life, and they, they, need, they need Scripture in a way that others don't see it. They, they're reading it, they're looking for it, looking to it in a way that maybe some others aren't looking to it. And I know that, that that your point is taken. That if you if, you know, so maybe we maybe that that's why we're here, and that's why the choice has to be made for some to decide if they can exist. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 a, in a denomination that tries to tries to have a ability to to be to offer. Uh, and, and, and live in, in a way that includes a broad range of people from a broad range of backgrounds and a broad range of experiences. And if, if that is, um, if, it, if, if, if that's the belief, mm -hmm. how can the bishop or anybody that works under the bishop mm -hmm. stand before a congregation and say, compromise? Well, that's, if that's how you see it being said, if, you, if, if you're hearing the word compromise uh, when we're saying, using words like... You said compromise in the discussion earlier, and mm -hmm. you're wanting the both sides to compromise. I mean, well, you know, I have gay friends and a smooth friend, mm -hmm. as a member, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. I accept them as individuals. Mm -hmm. I don't compromise on my faith that this is okay. Mm -hmm. It's not okay, but I'm not the judge. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm they're still my friends, my mm -hmm. family, whatever. Mm -hmm. But when I go to church, you know. It's a, it's a, one of the things that the United Methodist Church believes is that uh, the sacred worth of all people. And so that all people are, 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 are sacred in the eyes of God and are allowed to be able to receive God's word and God's love. Um, imagine someone coming to church here on Sunday, a whole family, or a couple, or whatever they may be designated, and sitting right here in the pew. They'd be welcome here. I, mean, I think the whole congregation is welcome. And, and right. And I, not, and, 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 but I wonder how would they feel I, welcome. I have to disagree with that. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't think, I mean, I think there are people who are definitely uh, saying that we've got the sign on the door. Mm -hmm. We
<laughs> Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. You know, there, there's a, it is, a, it is a, a lot of the things we're talking about, a lot of the uh, subjects that are before us, you know, I mean, you know, our, our scripture is, 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 is vital. God's word is, 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 is everything. And uh, now it begins to get different when we're in the face of, of, of a challenge like that, of a situation like that. And um, I think as far as I can, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to elaborate too far, but just to say that the, the rules that we are talking about that have been either kept or not kept is to be, uh, will we allow uh, persons who are homosexual to be ordained? That is the rule in our book of discipline. It doesn't really say anything about, we say we welcome them to worship and be a part of our congregation. But the rule is we will not ordain uh, uh, self-avowed practicing homosexuals and we will not um, um, perform marriages, same-sex marriages in the church. So um, a homosexual couple comes, uh, people, they come to worship and uh, they're, 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 they're hearing the word of God. I know they will get a good, the good word really well here. And, um, but they couldn't get married. If they were feeling called to serve, they wouldn't be able to be served. That's the way it is with the United Methodist Church. The problem has been where some have not, really, not felt their way and they wanted to offer the homosexual couples more, homosexual people more. And, um, and that is kind of where our impasse has been. There have been some who just have not but uh, accepted anything like that more. So the homosexual family of people, individuals, they're in the middle of that. They feel left out. And uh, that's what's happening. And that's why some of them are taking to lashing out, doing extreme things to get, a, to get the attention and be making known what they're experiencing. So that's kind of part of how we got to some of these very difficult places that we are right now. Uh, did I see another question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'd be glad to speak to that. So, um, the the book of discipline, the, the book that holds uh, how we organize and how we structure our rule book, it, it contains the articles of religion, the basic articles of religion, the Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, the, everything we 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 pronounce in our in our uh, Apostles' Creed. You know, died, buried, raised from the dead. Third day he rose, ascended unto heaven. Uh, he, he died for our sins, for our salvation. All of these beliefs, these basic beliefs, are what are in our book of discipline. It's what is there. It's our articles of religion. It's fixed. It's not changed. To change that, it takes like two thirds of that 800 the world vote, and then every conference has to have two thirds of the vote. None of that's ever been up before anyone to change any of our beliefs, our basic beliefs, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and if God salvation for all of the world. That has never changed in our belief system. Um, but what you have is, uh, you take for instance some of the videos coming from seminary. So seminary is like a, like a college setting. There are, young, there are people there uh, exploring and developing and formulating their faith. Some of these seminaries are, have been in the center of controversy because students are going there, that's, there some of them are pretty uh, progressive, some of them in their thinking. And, and many, many start out when they're younger, they have high ideals. But some of the things that have happened and some of the positions they've taken have come on the national scene 
I can remember when I was in college and seminary, some of the things that were going on there. Um, you, you didn't, the world doesn't need to know what goes on in most college campuses and in most classes and most, because there are the young minds, the forming minds might go anywhere. But what has happened is what they're doing and they're exploring, they're experimenting in these seminaries is, um, you know, it's gotten in, to become a part of this conversation. And uh, but the, the final uh, truth is that these are students, you know, they're not. Uh, most of them, I, I, would, I don't know who actually said that, but most of them are still in formation. They're still on the path. They're still seeking to become uh, involved or ignited or affiliated with some, with the denomination in some way. Whether or not they will would mean they'll have to go through a whole process of demonstrating their ability to know the faith and the, the tenets of the faith and the practice of the faith. They have to know the beliefs, the basic beliefs of the church. They'll have to demonstrate their, their readiness and, and their willingness to understand, talk about God and, and, their, and their, their fruitfulness and their effectiveness. They have a whole lot that they have to go through before they become pastors and leaders of a church. And uh, remember I said earlier, there's only two that, that were ordained this year. A whole lot. Some of them may have just not been interested in the church. And uh, I know that there's some all, every year who don't make the qualification. Now, um, what is the United Methodist Church going to be, and how does that uh, fit in? And uh, I believe that's a concern that a lot of people have. Uh, will um, you know? Will in sem will is seminary? There's some who are afraid is, is what something like that coming out of a seminary is that a sign of what the church is going to become? And I believe with all my heart that our conservative and traditional sisters and brothers who are united, who remain united in Methodist Church, there'll be some who will stay. Some won't have a ch choice to leave. Some won't have the resources. Some won't have the ability. Some will ha have a desire to even leave. There's some who will stay, and I believe with all of my heart, my brothers and sisters who are more conservative and more traditional are going to fight. They're going to they're gonna advocate as strongly as they can for things not to go far away from the center and the truth of God's word. And, and, and to me, in terms of the global, what that's going to mean that maybe a couple of churches that are conservative and... and yeah, that's, that is the question. That is absolutely the right question. As I say, if many are leaving and going, that's taking more away from that, a, a shaping of forming what we're going to be. And, uh, you know, um, and we all, you know, we'll... So... At, your church is one that's going to make a decision. Others will make a decision. By the time all of this kind of comes together, we'll know where we are. We'll know who, who's left. We'll go from there. But we cannot know that, that we don't have the answer to what that particular future is going to be. The choice we make now uh, has to be uh, uh, done with this way and everything that we know, who we believe. Some things we know, we know the problem with the United Methodist Church as it is now. We know that. We have hopes of what the future will be. We don't know what that's going to be. Somewhere we got to make a decision about what that, how that's going to impact us. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. We have to go. We have to stop this one. That's right. You, and as I you would have like it. to know more about the disaffiliation. Okay. And, but I'm sorry. I, we can't say. Are you going to be able to... Uh, can, can I give you something to take with you? Sure. Uh, we, we have... We have uh, do we have a we have a stop time, Pastor? Do we need to stop? We have to about one. Okay, okay. We have lunch. Do we, that we got with that we have to stop for that. I'm sorry. This affiliation stuff got to stop. Okay, okay. All right. Well, let me give you this to take, sir, and, 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 and I'm going to pass this out to everybody. We can move on. Hit a couple of those. Thank you. And, and sure. God bless you and take care. Yeah. Be safe. Thank and uh, we'll, we'll uh, I'm going to pass these out. We're going to, let's move on. Here you go. Here, there's three of them there. Two in this. Yes, yes, sir. You, you talked about our theology and our doctrine, you know, that in the discipline, you know, that's not going to sustain. But, you know, we've got rules in the discipline that are not being followed. Yes, sir.
they're not big fish of what these are. But but you, our leadership is not I'm, keeping our standards. I'm expecting, did, did y'all get them? Did y'all get them? Okay, I'm expecting, I'm ex, we are expect, some of us are expecting, you have one already? Yeah, okay. uh, some of us are expecting, uh, thank you, sir. Some of us are expecting, uh, I hope you forgive me for talking while I'm moving around here, but some of us are expecting, here's a different handout here for you. Um, the, the, maybe even the, the general conference might address some of that. Um, maybe, oh, I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe it'll work out that, uh, maybe it'll work out that some new uh, restrictions and new, uh, you know, I believe there'll be someone there who's thinking that same thing, not only what the policy is going to be, but, but, that, but that the bishops and all of those who are in roles and uh, positions to take accountability will have to be more accountable in, their, uh, in how they uh, hold people accountable for their actions. Maybe churches will have to be more so. Uh, more held accountable for, for their actions and how they handle things. But we don't know. We don't know. Said is, is mm -hmm. accurate. You know, a lot of us interpreted the traditionalist lead, mm -hmm. and it's not just going to global church. That, mm -hmm. that Other places, not, yes, yes. You know, you can, you can stay independent. Right. But that, that influence is gone mm -hmm. from the United Methodist Church, and then, you know, there's, there's nothing holding that back. Right. That's hard. To, it's, it's, it, that, I can see that scenario is real for us because we don't know yet. We don't know how many will leave. We don't know who is going to be remaining. Uh, but I, I just know with all my heart that there are going to be those who are remaining who are going to try their best to represent and keep the church to be a balance. So for many of us, we say we United Methodist Church. That means we have to be in, uh, including of, of all. We have to be including. We, 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 we have to, we, we, we are obligated to be sure that there is room, a way, a way for all churches, including our more, those with more traditional conservative values. You know, a lot of our talk is about those who are more liberal and more progressive in their thinking. We spend a lot of time on that because that's where the issue is coming from. But uh, I, I'm, I'm praying, all I can do is pray and hope, and, and there are many who may be like me, how can we... Have, create, have a church that is a place where those who are more traditional, more conservative, can continue to be the church that they are and, and, and not be forced. You know, I'm pretty sure I've heard that there's going to be a way that those who are uh, more conservative in their beliefs are not going to be forced upon them to, to accept the, so you, you won't be forced to perform a same-sex marriage in your church. You won't be forced to have a pastor who is not who is who is a, a homosexual or LGBTQ community. You you know you won't be forced to have anything like that going on. Um, um, and that's I've heard I heard that that's a hope you know. And there's not there's not yes yes pastor. Yes. Is because the denomination gives us cover as an umbrella that doesn't represent the Constitution of the United States, which rules that they had to accept gay marriage. Mm -hmm. Activist gays have been going out to churches, to bakeries, to uh, artistic places, mm -hmm. and challenging them to, to that you have to. No, sir. Uh, there, there is, there is. The world is that different than what my well, your point is very well taken, and it's a very, a very, a very, very significant point you're making about 
how the Constitution and the, and the Book of Discipline currently says that, that United Methodist churches nor pastors are allowed to perform these marriages. And now, to keep in mind, a hope now, a hope, all we can do is hope, is that when we, re, when we form this denomination, it will, I, do, I think that the, 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 the rest will leave if it's not included a way for churches and pastors who do not wish to do that, who have no desire and will not do that, and there are many among us here who won't do it, okay? And, uh, uh, and, if, and, and th th there will be a way in that same book of discipline, in that same law and constitution that, that says that churches have a right to determine whether or not they are going to, to, to participate in any of that. They can say in their rules that they will not, their bylaws, they can say that they will not perform that. And, and we believe in all our hearts that that's going to be, there are people fighting for that. We, I think there are many who know that there are going to be some strong efforts and, the, and, and it may be leaning a little bit in a way where that, um, yeah, there's going to be some liberal moves, uh, concern, uh, progressive moves and changes. But there are also going to be some that are going to protect the remainder of us who are more conservative and who are going to serve us and protect us. And that's what we are looking for. Many of us who are, are staying with more conservative values and beliefs are going to be watching that very, very closely. And uh, let me say that there's always been a way to leave the United Methodist Church. There's a way to leave it right now. And this way now, without this policy that I just had the information I passed out to you about, is a little bit more involved. But uh, there's always going to be a way. And when this one expires, there's going to be another way. In 2024, uh, when this one expires at the end of uh, at, uh, December 31st of 2023, there'll be about a six-month period. A, we've got to wait for that to happen. When 2024 comes and there'll be some churches who can't do anything until then because they just don't have the ability. I'm, I'm not saying yours, but some may, have, may not have the ability. Um, there'll be other ways. One of the alternate ways to close the church, uh, to do, to do this, this, this discontinue, close the church, discontinue as the United Methodist Church. That's in the Book of Discipline, uh, paragraph 2549. And you discontinue as, a, as the United Methodist Church, and you can be reinstated as another denomination when you make that designation. I'm saying all that to say is, uh, you know, if, Something were to happen, and this denomination became something that's absolutely intolerable. Um, whether it's now or whether it's later, and you can no longer stay with a part of this, there's going to be a way to, to, de to depart. There's always been, there will, will be a way to depart. And uh, what many are saying now the, the before us is, this is a way now um, that that is, that, that's, that's a lot less, a little less burdensome. There, there's some responsibility, but, you know, uh, but there'll always be a way. And uh, we just hope that there's going to be a way for more, more conservative churches to stay in it. I mean, there's no way that this denomination can stay there United Methodist and not have a circle of, 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 of acceptance for everyone and a way for everyone to exist. What time would we have to be there? We've got to be there be there at 2? Okay. So, okay. Well, so it's time to stop. I, I've been talking a lot. I think I'm rambling now. Um, I just want to go with some, the handout that I have for you there. I just want to kind of go real quickly. This is a, this is more slides, but it's going to go quick. Um, uh, I've been talking about how we got here. Uh, this is the process if you're choosing now. If you decide to make a decision now, uh, you've already begun it. You've already begun it by contacting the district superintendent. Okay, all of this is in your is in the handout. Um, um, you enter into an intentional time of prayer. Assess the impact of the decision upon you, the church, the community, and the conference. So we kind of talked about that. How we want to try to part ways in a way that doesn't not too hard for everybody. Um, but just remember, you know, your community, uh, what does that change? The, 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 your visitors who come here 
uh, uh, you know, another thing about any partnerships you have in the community, any kind of agreements, anything like that, that, you know, that requires you to be that's, that's tied to the United Methodist Church. You don't have to look at any contracts, any agreements that you have, because uh, your name is going to change. The name of this church would change if you disaffiliate. Denomination would change. It would be a different denomination. So a lot, some things are going to change. Um, first, one of the things that will happen officially would be the re reincorporation of your church. Uh, that's like a, a, a process filed with the uh, uh, state, the Secretary of State. Uh, this is official stuff where your, your incorporation, you would be, right now you are incorporated under the umbrella of the United Methodist Church. So, so we're good now. And so if, if you decide to disaffiliate, you have to file that. And uh, that means you'd have to reincorporate with the other denomination. So that means, um, again, a process that you, if, you if, it's a, if it's a denomination that's already formed like the Global Methodist Church, they have things in place already. If you go independent, you'd have to simply, well, it's not simply, but you have to write your bylaws, you have to get a new board of directors, you have to do everything that the application process asks you for and in filing with the state. It doesn't cost a whole lot, uh, but it does require some effort. Uh, if there are any designated or endowed funds, uh, that would have to be, you know, a designated giving, when a, when a family gives a, a designated a donation, they say, I want to give the million dollars to your church for always maintaining your music ministry as long as you are a United Methodist Church. That's a designated fund. They may not have been thinking about disaffiliation. And this is a hypothetical example. But the, in that language, it says, as long as you remain a United Methodist Church. So... Uh, you might have to go to that individual or to that family and, and just be sure that they know you're changing the denomination if you'd like to make this change legally in this fund and get their approval for that. You know, it's, it's not that hard, but those are the kind of delicate things that you have to deal with. Uh, any unpaid loans, I, I don't know how that affects you. Outstanding grants for ministry with the conference, uh, that would be negotiated, you know, uh, but we just have to consider that. Then insurance, you know, insurance for your building uh, facility uh, is currently with the conference. And you know how, I'm sure those of you who the trustees especially, I know you know how that works. Uh, but, you, you know, right now we're in a group plan with a company called Church Mutual. And um, they cover all churches and their group regardless of the uh, na nature and state of the church. Uh, and uh, so it's just finding an insurance company that will cover you. You have wonderful facilities. I'm sure it'll be easy to insure. And <clears throat> you might even be able to get competitive rates uh, with, with, a, with another company, but you would not no longer be under the uh, insurance uh, for the, for the uh, conference. Different liability issues, property insurance. Uh, right now, for instance, um, if, uh, say, let's take a scenario where, so, where someone wants to perform a same-sex marriage and they come uh, into the church and the pastor says no, and, uh, and, uh, and the church says no, and they say they want to try to sue or something like that. You're covered under this current insurance as an umbrella, a million dollar coverage for any kind of legal uh, issue that might come up. You are protected from that. And, uh, and uh, I, I, we have a couple of lawsuits going on in our district right now, other church, uh, and, uh, but the conference covered that and paid that and, and paid the negotiated rate amount, you know, they, they plea bargain, whatever you do, and uh, the conference stepped in and took care of that by insurance. So you got that coverage, so you want to be sure you get all the right coverage and get some legal coverage and all that just to be on the safe side. Uh, uh, anything happens. Process of pastoral succession, we talked about that a little bit, you know, which we, 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 we're learning, we're trying to learn. Maybe our track record is not, take care, sir, God bless you. Okay, yes, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you. God bless you, God bless you. You know, um, um, if you go independent, uh, maybe it might be a suggestion to, uh, to go to a church that is currently independent and see how they do it, you know. Sometimes they form uh, pastoral search committees and they, they uh, uh, do interviews and promote around the world and, and, and uh, that kind of thing. 
um, the Global Methodist Church will be a lot like this church and how they do pastors and assign pastors, but it will be the same in terms of, uh, but, but that would be something to consider. Uh, and then you, what your current pastor's plans are, the first thing, one of the early things you're going to face is what is going to be the situation with your pastor. As we talk about what your pastor's plans are like right now, before this is over, before this year is up, we're going to be talking to a pastor about what his plans are. And, uh, you know, that's important in, in, the, in the consideration. Uh, uh, let's see. You have to have a statement, a plan. If you're going to go independent, um, uh, you know, uh, or with another entity, you still have to write out what your theological tenets are going to be, you know, your governance structure, how you're going to do your missional goals, your anticipated costs. Some of that you'll need that for your reincorporation, you know. Um, then a written statement for articulating the theological and missional foundations and seeking this affiliation. Now, so we know there are a lot of other things that disappoint us right now, but when you make this statement for this, by this policy, it's all related to human sexuality. That's the only thing that you, you know, need to put. You can put the other things that are, you can state the other problems that you would have with the church if you wanted, but on the record, Homeless, human, human sexuality, the issue, is what this policy is all about. Uh, this is what rose up from the general conference. Uh, the listening sessions are part of this plan. The church conference, if we get to after the third session, uh, uh, somewhere related to that, you, if you're ready, if you want to vote, if you're ready to vote, that's when we will, we will uh, have a vote. The voting will go pretty, a little kind of structured. You know, I'll be bringing the ballots in. I'll be inviting uh, uh, two members from the congregation uh, to join. When you, when you come in, you get a ballot. Uh, I'm gonna, it's going to sound a little technical now, but your, your membership will have to be verified by the members who will be helping to do that because it's, it's, it's only members who are, who are in good standing, baptized members who are able to vote. And uh, your, your, your membership would be verified. You get a ballot with your name on it. It would be numbered. And uh, we would have that process for voting. Those ballots are the property of the conference. We would have someone there to take copies of it or whatever we need to do so you can have your copy. And that's how we'll do it. And um, if, you, if you choose to go that way, it has to be a two-third vote. Um, you know, what's that, 100 people present? 67 or 68 would have to be in favor uh, for disaffiliation if for you to actually disaffiliate. Uh, and, um, you know, like we were saying, concerned about, if, you know, uh, what happens to those who may not. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, the church pays the full previous 12 months and the next 12 months apportionment. Right now, <clears throat> between now and the end of your six-month period, we're talking about the apportionments for 2022 and the apportionments for 2023. You already halfway paid, I'm thinking, a part, most way paid, I think, with the 2022 apportionment. All you would need to pay for that would be the 2023 amount <clears throat> and the full unpension, unfunded pension responsibilities. I talked about that a little earlier, um, based on a figure from the annual conference. I don't know if you've gotten your figure yet, but you'll know, I think the pastor says, yes, you have that figure. So it would be that and that, and that's it. That's all that it would be cost. One more cost will be any closing cost to transfer the deed over to your church. Uh, and this is you know, like in selling any property, it's the closing cost involved. And uh, that's what that would be. Then uh, all forms and processes, there's a, there's a, there's a form that uh, has all of these steps in it. And then it would have to be signed so that it will be ask, asking for the signature of two trustees uh, from your church here, uh, the signature of the district superintendent, and the tr signature of two conference trustees, and uh, the signature of the saying that every step has been completed. That's all they're saying. And uh, this is what I was talking about earlier. This whole policy uh, expired from 2019. It started then. It expires in, in, in uh, 2023 at the end of next year. But if you, 
extend beyond 2023 uh, and you need more time, this will be the next step. It will be added, but the policy will be honored. It will be similar to just closing a church. It will be a closed. You have the United Methodist. You're not closing a church. But technically, you're discontinuing as the United Methodist Church. And uh, there'll be another related uh, process tied to that. There will, uh, the trustees will transfer the property to the newly formed entity. So uh, by that time, you would have hopefully decided what you would want to do if you wanted to leave the United Methodist Church. And if you want to leave the United Methodist Church, hopefully by that time, you'll have all your incorporation done or reincorporation done or your affiliation done. And... Uh, um, uh, um, then with every step done in the, in the process and you're, you're, you're being reincorporated to the new entity that you're going to be, want to be a part of, the conference will transfer the property to your property. It's as simple as that. No, no nonprofit organization can give to, a, to another organization that's not the same. So you have to be the same. <clears throat> Simply reuniting, organizing with a uniting with another denomination and all of that. In between that, what has to happen is the majority vote of the annual conference. <clears throat> so if you chose to do this, it could be done by uh, the annual conference. Uh, you're in time to, uh, if you get all, all of the steps completed, if this is what you want to do, uh, you're in time maybe to be on the about agenda for the uh, annual conference in June of 2023. And, uh, and keep in mind that all the steps have to be completed by, uh, and the uh, fees, the uh, apportionments and all of that would have to be paid on the day of or before the annual conference. It has to be indicated enough uh, 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 indication that that's done before your name will be on the ballot on the agenda at annual conference. So everything has to be completed by that annual conference, okay? So that's how the process will go. But if you do that, uh, with those things that we said, the property will be, uh, you'll have the property in the name of your church, whatever the new name of your church is, and uh, whatever the, uh, that's another thing, you think about what your name will be. You know, uh, you have to think about how to read, maybe it's, maybe it's not, won't be, that's not hard at all, but. That'll be another thing, you know, and uh, whatever that new name will be, that will be that property, the deed will be transferred to that name. And so that is, uh, that's, that's pretty much a quick synopsis of what is in that form, that sheet I just handed out to you. And uh, yes, ma'am. At this point, the way that works, it'll be you, you, because of when you start it. You know, you start it in time for this to be the previous year already. The previous year and the current year is all it says. So if you're talking about 2023 and the, if you're 2022 is when you start and you're, you're coming to your six-month period and the vote is happening in 2023, that's the current year and then the previous year is 22. So that, those are the only two, and so it doesn't change. And so, um, yeah, I don't know if that does that answer. Okay, okay, okay. So, okay, well, okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so um, that's the most that I, I, uh, I have to offer today. Any questions, any thoughts, any, anything uh, you'd like to know? I'm trying I'm try to... We're we'll engage it a little deeper next time. I have, I have, I'll have some ways to go take this a little deeper into some of the beliefs and things that, you know, I think some of the questions that came up. Uh, we will, I think we'll go a little farther with that uh, for another the next meeting. Yes, ma'am. Oh, do we have a day for the next meeting yet, Pastor? I don't know that we do. Okay, we do not. We did not set the next date. Uh, um, but we can, uh, you know, I, I kind of 
it usually usually the uh, you know pastor and I are about a phone call away from each other, and we kind of handle it that way. Uh, uh, but if you you know, however you want to do that, uh, you know maybe give pastor some, your 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 dates or if if there are some dates you all if there's a day you know. My my schedule is very limited because I have several churches doing this, and so I'm all over and and like they're like only a few days left uh, this year. More of this, um, uh, and so uh, so it's like maybe like a morning or a day. That's why I appreciate your flexibility today. Uh, but we have to work hard to find any more time this year. Maybe there may be it may be one in December, but but that's getting kind of close to Christmas. I don't I don't know if you if you want to be talking about this during Christmas, but you know, but but it's, it won't be at I mean, I'm, I'm gonna do it. It won't be at Christmas, but I mean, I mean, getting a little closer to uh, mid December. There might be some time, but since you have, uh, your, you started, uh, your letter is day October, so April, you know, we have time to do, you know, one or two of them in, in, in the new year, uh, maybe, but I'm not sure. Uh, so I'll let you all, maybe, we, cause this is not the place or time, I'll let you all work on that, and Pastor, we can be in touch, right? Is that, is that your, are you comfortable with that? Maybe being sure that we, you all tell us what you want, and, uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. So, thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you, uh, Pastor, for uh, your uh, what, setting this up. Uh, Pastor, we did communicate quite a bit to get this date set up, and, and I thank you all for cooperating. What a wonderful setup here. We are here, and we're going to try to make it. And the, the, I, I hear that there's a, a barbecue dinner out there. Boy, that was, that was very appealing to me. Uh, um, uh, and uh, we'll, then we'll get to, you know, then we'll, we'll set up. I'll be doing this. Something like this, the Belmont, and all this in today, it really helps. Uh, and I thank you for this uh, way of creative way to make this work, Pastor. God bless you all. I know it's a difficult time. I don't want to be talking about this. You know, I'd rather be. You know, I'd rather be out trying to plan for a ministry. I'd be out, rather out, be out trying to do a, a program to try to attract young families and couples. I'd, I'd rather be out trying to. Uh, plan a program for young people and increase the engagement of young children in our church. And I, I'd rather be out trying to help people through crises of life and 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 recover from the problems and state of life. I don't want to be talking about breaking up a church. I, I didn't train for it. I didn't sign up for any of this. So so uh, this is this is definitely breaking my heart to have to be talking about this. I'm not here to argue with anybody. I'm not trying to fight anybody. I don't want to argue with you. And uh, 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 and I know how, you, but you feel. I know you feel strong about this, and I know that I represent the denomination, and I accept that. And uh, I try my best to to, to 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 be honest as I can. And and uh, there, there, there's so much I can't change. I can't I can't control how all this has happened. Um, but uh, um, but I, 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 you know I have my my confidence is in you in you uh, you. Uh, have, 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 you, you are, you are responsible for all of this, this wonderful congregation, the legacy of this church. Uh, my confidence is, is in you, my sisters and brothers of your heart. I worked with some of you before in many, in more in-depth ways. I know your heart. I know you love the Lord. And, 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 and my hope is in you and that you, you're following God's will and, and, and whatever you choose to do. You know, uh, I'm going to have the highest regard and respect for you, for your pastor, and uh, I'll do everything I can to support you in whatever decision you make. So, um, so, so, so I hope you don't, don't want to feel the pressure that someone's fighting to resist or make this hard for you. But I'm going to ask the pastor to come and, and you, if it's, would you bless us and bless us with food and give us instructions? Thank you.